Um, first order of business is to review the minutes of the meeting of July 20th, 2004. Everyone's had a chance to look at the minutes. I move that they be accepted. Moved and seconded to accept the minutes. All in favor? Okay. Uh, I'd like to identify the correspondence. We have some email from the town attorney regarding Hamlin Street, letter from the town manager regarding open space, memorandum from the town planner regarding 1226 Shore Road, memorandum from the code enforcement officer regarding 1226 Shore Road, email from the town attorney regarding autumn tides, letter from Lee Bumstead regarding Blueberry Ridge, email from Mr. and Mrs. Eberl regarding Blueberry Ridge, memorandum from the town council, regarding open space zoning amendment, letter from the town attorney regarding open space zoning amendment, planning commissioner's journal, summer 2004. And since the agenda was drafted, we also have received some additional correspondence, an email from uh, public works director regarding autumn tides subdivision, a letter from Post Associates regarding Autumn Tide subdivision of August 17th. A letter from Peter and Alice Rand of August 15th regarding 1226 Shore Road. Okay. And that takes care of the correspondence. I'll just run through the agenda quickly tonight. Under old business, we have the uh, Hamlin Street subdivision request for subdivision review, the Autumn Tide subdivision request for minor subdivision review, and that's scheduled for a public hearing this evening. Uh, request for site plan review, Cape Elizabeth Family Medicine edition, for site plan completeness under new business, Blueberry Ridge subdivision amendments, uh, and Murray Private Road Review under Subdivision Ordinance. A request for an amendment to the Zoning Ordinance BA District and a request for an amendment to the Zoning Ordinance BB District. So first item is Hamlet Street Subdivision. Good evening. Um, I will describe to you what's changed on the plans from uh, the last submittal. Um, at our last meeting, we did have the uh, the updated wetlands line that were done by uh, Woodlot Alternatives. So we showed those to you on the board, but they were not in your plans. They're in the plans now in the packets you have. Um, so that's probably the largest change we made. Um, a resulting chart uh, change from that was uh, on lot one um, the, the space was getting a little crunched with the new wetlands uh, here this RP2 wetlands so what we did is we ended up changing um, moving uh, some lot lines to create a larger building envelope for that um, there was some question in the, in the last uh, meeting uh, if a house could fit in there if we could construct a home in that smaller building envelope it is about 54 feet wide um, you confirm that, yeah, 54 feet wide by 60 foot deep. Um, what I did, you, you see these pictures here, I took some pictures of a home that Mike uh, Cloutier, the applicant, built in uh, South Portland on a 50 foot wide lot. Um, that building you're looking at is uh, 34 feet wide by 26 feet deep. And, and you can see in, uh, more clearly in these pictures here how close um, how little land he had to disturb outside of the building footprint. Um, and that is what is shown on the plan. This this home, I drew it in plan view on, on the plan that you guys have. Um, and it fits in there pretty comfortably. Um, in a way, um, similar to how we put 
uh, some fences in here to discourage people from altering wetlands in the future. We put a fence um, actually along the whole length of the building envelope on lot one to discourage people from, uh, from going into there. Another option that we do have um, in which we're asking the board um, for approval tonight is to actually fill a small portion of the wetlands here. This is about approximately 2,000 square feet, uh, 2,096 square feet to be exact, would be filled here. And what that would do is make a more uniform look down the street. All these lots, all these homes and yards would be above the street. It would make for a cleaner look and it would provide for a better lot. It would have more yard. But that is not necessary to, to, to build lot one. So that's going to be a kind of two options that I present before the board tonight. Um, but like I said, either one works. One works a little bit better. Um, and I can answer questions on that uh, after I, now or after I finish. Um, so I'll keep going. Um, the buffer, um, as I explained in, in our last presentation on the RP1 wetlands here that was mapped by Woodlot Alternatives, is shown two different ways. It's shown um, from the end of the RP1 and then using the 100 foot rule where if a wetland is less than 100 feet wide, you can go another 100 feet up and start the, the buffer from there. So that's what the second line here is, is. That's what that is. Doesn't really affect us too much with this plan. It just shows the two options that that we have at looking at that buffer. Uh, Hamlin Street, the way it is today, actually goes through this buffer and we are, um, according to the code, allowed to reconstruct that roadway. So, uh, like, I, like I say, either one of these buffers works for this plan. Where it will have an effect is um, on this lot here, which Mike has um, a purchase and sales agreement with Mr. Verstashi on. Um, but it is not part of, the, of, of this uh, subdivision. It's, it's another lot, and to construct that in the future, we would need to go with that 100-foot rule. But I believe that's a separate um, item that gets looked at when you go for your building permit. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, Maureen. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, some, a few other things that um, we've done um, since our last meeting, uh, easements. Um, we have talked with Mr. Fristashi regarding these two lots. We used to have a culvert here. We have taken that out. Um, and the reason for that is we have agreed to fill um, Mr. Fristashi's lots here. Um, and what that does is it, it eliminates the depression that used to be here, this wet spot. And um, um, there's no more need for a wetland. And there, we would be, with this option, filling this small portions of wetlands here, which is about um, a little over 1,000 square feet. Um, and while we're on wetlands, um, on this area here, there'll be about where the culvert's coming in, where we're, we're replacing the culvert, about 500 square feet. So altogether, we have about, um, we have less than a tenth of an acre, which is, does not trip the uh, Army Corps permit. Um, so it's very, uh, it's a small amount of wetlands disturbance. Um, and like I said, we do not need the lot one one. It would, it would make for a better lot. Um, so because that culvert is now no longer there, there's no need for an easement for this culvert. So that takes care of those easements. Um, the other easements on, on this side over here, we do have an easement from uh, Mr. Turnrose, or the Turnroses, I should say. And because the, Mike has a purchase and sales agreement on this lot, um, in your packets you'll see an easement from Michael Cloutier to the town of Cape Elizabeth for this easement. So we've covered all our bases on the easements, um, is a short of that one. Um, so with this grading of these two lots, we're actually going to take down this garage. We're going to get rid of that, that older falling down garage. Um, some smaller comments um, from the town engineer and the staff. Um, a stop sign at the intersection of Hamlin Street and Stevenson Street. We have shown that clearly on the plans. Um, it was there before, but not labeled as clearly as it should have been. So um, that is there. Um, foundation drains for lots seven and eight. We had them connected directly to the manhole before, the drainage manhole. And Steve uh, Harding uh, mentioned that it was, commented that it was more traditional to tie them into the drain lines themselves. We've done that. Um, 
And then the Inland Fish and Wildlife, uh, we did get some correspondence from them saying that there are no um, significant uh, wildlife habitat um, on this property, and that's in your information packets. Um, and then um, there were a couple of small things, uh, other small things from Steve Harding, uh, the cost estimate. We need to provide a more detailed cost estimate um, before we start construction. Um, and we will have to file a uh, um, construction notice of intent. Um, well, I, I need to confirm this, but it, it appears that we're disturbing more than an acre of land here. And that means you, you have to file a uh, main general permit, uh, construction notice of intent, which basically notifies the right people that you're about to disturb a bunch of land. It's not a permit that requires uh, approval. Rather, it's just a, a notice. Um, and then finally, um, a few days ago, I got some correspondence from DEP about the, um, we, we filed the permit by rule here and it was approved. Um, but we have received a field determination um, in the last couple of days, basically saying that we can't construct this weir. I don't know if you remember um, the ponding that was occurring here on next to Mr. Turnose's lot. We, we tried our best to, to keep that um, bit of a dilemma here in order to meet the town roadway standards and to make this roadway passable we needed to install that 24 inch culvert I don't know if you remember and it had to be lower um, in order for this roadway not to get flooded in the 25 year storm event well what that does is it, it, it lowers by a foot that water level is what it'll do and the best way to do to prevent that was to put that we're in there to keep that that water level um, but the DEP standards does not allow that, and I did speak with um, with uh, Dawn Buker over there, and she and she said that we would not be able to get that permit. She did she did go visit the site um, and made a field determination. I have copies of that if you would like them. Um, you know why she was supposed to? Um, you know, it's considered a structure in a stream. And you're not you're not allowed to build structures within 75 feet of a stream. Um, and definitely not in the pa you're not allowed to block the, the passage of the stream, which is what this would be doing. So I asked her, can we grade a little berm in there? She said, well, that, that does the same thing. So, um, um, and th that's pretty much um, everything that, that has changed on the plans. And we'll entertain any questions at, at this time. So is it true that the net effect of not having the wear will be the pond could drop one foot? Is that what you're... Um, it, it's not, we don't know that for sure, but it does appear that the, the culvert that's, that's there now is what's impounding the water. Uh, the, the way it appears is the culvert was built too high. Um, but we don't, you know, we don't really know that. We know that if we drop the culvert, it'll most likely drain that, that ponding area. Some of it might still stay there because it's a very flat area and it goes up and down a little bit. So there'll still be some ponding, but I, I can't uh, say that it won't have an effect on it. Yes, Barbara. When you fill those other lots on the other side of the road, yep. um, is that going to have any effect on runoff or is it going to help it? Um, Stormwater runoff. It, it will essentially have no, no change, really. We don't. Um, <clears throat> it's not pushing anything where it wasn't going before. It's, a, it's splitting the lot, and some of it will drain towards the street and some of it away. It'll be much like it would have been. Um, the drainage used to come, it was, it's actually very flat out there, and the drainage doesn't really go anywhere. And we were putting in the culvert as more of a kind of a safety precaution. If there was a, pu a, a puddle here, it would have somewhere to drain. But since we filled this, there's, there's no more puddle. And when someone comes in and builds on this lot anyways, they, they would have filled it, just like all these other ones. 
that answer your question? So, so, so does your current plan, has the uh, weir been removed from the current plan, or have you not no, it hasn't. changed that yet? I was um, thinking that maybe that could be a condition of approval, or we could supply plans um, after the fact. It, it's in the plans now, that weir is. We, we just found out, it might have been Friday. I think I got the actual determination on Monday. Any other questions? John. Yes. Yeah. The area on lot one that you're asking a, res uh, a resource protection permit for, yeah. uh, there's a comment in the town engineer, in the engineer's letter, paragraph three, has, has that concern been addressed in your plans, uh, that the uh, portion of the wetland to be filled in lot one be quantified? Yeah. Uh, no, that is not in the plans. Um, that was something I was hoping to put a as a condition, as a condition, and I would, I think that that could go on the on the mylar on the on the. We're going to update the mylar with a survey seal on it um, before the the board signs it. And I was thinking I could put that into that plan so that it's on record. I guess it would be on record uh, tonight through the meeting minutes. But and the, the Maureen, the draft motion that's in our materials does incorporate that condition, correct? I uh, think that if there's a requirement that the uh, yeah. issues raised in the engineer's letter be addressed. Yeah. Okay. Yes, bro. Um, the house on lot nine, <clears throat> have you resolved that problem yet? Are you building within the footprint of the old house or is that? That has not been uh, fully resolved yet. Um, we, we have filed, um, we have talked with, uh, with an attorney about that, how we should go about it. Um, and the, we filed an appeal just to reserve our right to do that. Um, what we're hoping to do is to have a meeting. We're, we're still, it's still in process. We'd like to have a meeting to, to resolve that issue. Um, it's still on hold. It's not, it's not building. We're not building it. Um, but like I said, that's going to be taken care of in a, in a separate process, and we will come to a, to a solution. Worst case for us is to rebuild. Um, hopefully, it, it doesn't have to come down to that. But if it does, it does. Any other questions? Okay. So just to revisit that, on C2 you show um, the original dotted line and the double line for the what's presently there. Um, that is that going to be on our approved plans if we approve you tonight, or is that going to be taken off the approved plan? It's on the plans uh, tonight. It is in your packets. Um, and that's something that is, is depending on how you would lot line, uh, Lot 9 considered part of the subdivision? Lot 9 is. But as far as the building permit, that was a separate. So that's a separate item that he doesn't have to address. We don't have to address yeah, that. Lot 9 was part of the land that, the, that was yes. part of the whole subdivision, so we told them they had to include it. But there was an existing house there, and the applicant pulled a building permit to rebuild the house. So that was allowed to continue during the subdivision review. I understand that. Yeah. OK. Maureen, to segue with what Dave said, how do we deal with it, though? Can we just, is that not part of our decision since that's now being resolved with the code enforcement office? What, what you're doing right now is approving the subdivision of the land. Right now, lot not, the, all of what we call the Hamlin Street subdivision is, I think, two and a half parcels. It's a parcel purchased and another parcel that was assembled. And we're taking all of that land, putting it all together, 
and then subdividing it up into nine lots. And what you're doing is reviewing the division of the land into individual lots. The building permit, as odd as it may sound, is on a separate track. Any other questions? Would you like a motion? A motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans, materials submitted, and the facts presented, the application of Cludia construction for for amendments to the previously approved Hamlin Street subdivision and the resource protection permit to reconfigure the road and lots into a nine lot subdivision located at the end of Hamlin Street be approved subject to the following conditions. That the plans and other submission materials be revised per the town engineer's comments in his letter dated 8-10-04. That a, number two, the performance guarantee be posted in an amount approved by the town engineer, a form approved by the town attorney, and all to be approved by the town manager. Number three, that deeds for the road, drainage easements, and evidence of purchase of the Fristacci lot be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed by the applicant. And number four, that there be no alteration of the site, no issuance of building permits, until the above conditions have been met and the plan has been signed and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds and all BEP permits have been issued. The applicant will not be required to construct the weir to pre preserve the pond level if BEP will not issue a permit that includes construction of the weir. And number five, do we want to add to that uh, requires requires issues raised in any letter to be addressed. Condition one, I believe, covers that. That's what I thought. So we do not need to say that. It's That's already been addressed, I think, okay. no. number one. No. So I, I will strike that. I four that it kind of says you have to make it all the way through one through three before you can even do number four. Right. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. I, I have a question. Sure. We really haven't covered the request to fill that, whether we are interested or if we'll consider, I shouldn't say are interested, filling that wetland, or are we just going to, by ignoring it, we're saying we're not willing to have the applicant do that. But we haven't talked about it, really. I, I thought that we had addressed that, that if the amount of wetlands to be filled had, were, were quantified in accordance with the town engineer's letter that that, that, that would be allowed. And, and I'm going to correct, we would get the number, um, which is I think what he said is, but I think Ms. Schenkel is, is correct. There should be some condition here that says that you approve the filling of, uh, what did you say, 1,000 square feet? Um, 2,000 for lot one. Okay, up 2, to 2,000 square feet along lot one as described by the applicant to be shown on the plans. It's, it's 2,096. You want to quantify it if you're going to do it. And I'm sorry. Okay. Does that make well, sense? Well, so you're suggesting we add an amount so that... I'm suggesting you say something that says you allow them to do it. And then we can... Because right now the plans don't show any filling that he is describing on lot one. That's and not reflected in the plan? In it's the not. No. Plan? No. He's just asking for it right now. Can I make a suggestion? Would we be able to say um, with the condition that they provide on the plan the quantified amount of wetlands disturbance and that it's acceptable by the planning staff? Well, I'd that? rather have a number that it not exceed. Okay. But, Lot please, one will not clarify. exceed. Right now, your plans don't show the fill, correct? Right. Okay. So if you want to allow them to do it, you need to say something about it's okay to do it and then... The not to exceed X number. And I, I'm saying if we, yeah, we tell them to put it on the plan and a not to exceed amount, and that makes it clear that they can do it and, and staff will take care of making sure the plans get revised. And, and the plans show a building envelope through the wetland. It's just not quantified. 
So Maureen's saying, let's quantify it. So wait a minute, you're saying that, that the plans that you submitted two weeks ago yeah. show this alteration? They show the building envelope going through the wetland. It shows it as building envelope. Okay. And it also shows a fence. Okay. So it's, it's one, or, one or the other. So but there is no quantity on the plan. Okay. So you're saying the plans show both options? Right. Okay, so still got to clarify which option you want then. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, well, then the motion will have to be amended. If we'll that's okay have with to add another condition. Right. Well, let's discuss that first. How do you want it to be? Or how do we want it to be? Or do we want to allow it? Well, he's given us two options. We can either, well, we have three options. We can either allow the, the fill, require the fence, or not allow either one. Is there any other options? That's enough. So, I guess to be more specific, what is the board's wishes in terms of fill versus the fence along the edge of the well? I think from my point, I'd rather see the fill. I agree. Because yeah. you know it's going to be done sometime. Yeah. Well, I think it'll make the subdivision look better. That's pretty varied land in there mm -hmm. and I, I don't think we're letting anything disturb too much of that one. I don't think it'll make a difference. I agree. Same. Anybody else okay with that? Okay. So it would be a condition, uh, we'll just review it here, it would be a condition to allow the fill on lot one not to exceed 2,000 2, square, square feet. Does that work? Right. Okay, so uh, amend the motion to number five, uh, amend it to, that we will allow um, fill on lot number one Do we need to put it in place of number four, we can, Mr. Chairman? We can just make num condition number four the last condition. Okay. How's that? So it just, the condition will be that the fill will be allowed on the wetland on lot number one, not to exceed 2,000 feet. Square, square feet. 2,000 square feet. All right. Okay, so the motion as amended, we need a second. 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 Any further discussion on the motion? Everybody understand it? Okay, all in favor of the motion? And that passes. Thank you. Thank you. May I say one more thing? Sure. I would like to commend your group. This has been a difficult project. There was a lot to consider there, and I think you worked very hard to work with both the planning board and the staff. And thank my compliments you. to all of you. And I, thank for, and I thank you for your help. And good luck building it. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for hearing us tonight. Um, my name is Owens McCullough, civil engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, here tonight on behalf of Wiley Enterprises, LLC, 
uh, Joel Fitzpatrick uh, of Wiley Enterprises is here tonight if you have any questions of him. Uh, we were last before the board in uh, July, actually July 20th, uh, for a preliminary plan approval uh, completeness review, uh, which was granted at that time. Subsequent to that, we had a site walk uh, where I believe John attended, Maureen, uh, representative of the Conservation Commission, uh, the applicant, and I think that was myself. Uh, we were able to walk the site and look at the center line of the road and where the project was going to go and get a general sense for it. I think everybody pretty much knows the piece of land uh, that uh, where the project is going to be located. Uh, just to recap, uh, the project is a five lot residential subdivision on a 15.86 acre uh, parcel of land. It's situated in the RA, RA zone and it's uh, across the street uh, from the Cross Hill subdivision and also across the street from the Leighton Farms uh, subdivision that the applicant uh, developed approximately two years ago and is currently under construction. Uh, this piece of land he purchased at the same time uh, but chose to hold on to it for a while and then uh, move forward with a subdivision after uh, he completed the other one. Uh, the subdivision will include approximately 500 linear feet of roadway. Uh, the access will be directly across the street from the Cross Hill Road. It will terminate at a cul-de-sac and will have five lots. Um, as part of this project, uh, we would also need to request a, a private access uh, approval for uh, lot number four and also an RP1 uh, wetlands permit for approximately 3,300 square feet of wetlands impact uh, for the project. Um, the project also includes open space of approximately 1.45 acres of land area that is required under the zone. Uh, there's a calculation uh, directly on the subdivision plan uh, that outlines how we arrived at that land area, uh, which is a specific number per lot that we had to meet. Uh, the subdivision will be served by underground utilities to include uh, public water, electric telephone, and most recently uh, we have switched from on-site septic systems to public sewer. Uh, that was a question I think that was discussed at the last meeting. Um, subsequent to that meeting, uh, we had to take a look at it closely from a technical standpoint because uh, to go to public sewer required us to put in individual pump stations on the lots uh, very similar to what was done on some of the lots at the Leighton Farm subdivision and also at the Cross Hill subdivision. Uh, those pumps uh, from those individual houses would pump up through a common line up to uh, Wells Road. In Wells Road there's a four inch horse main that this would connect into and then it would pump approximately to this location where the gravity sewers start. So what that will allow us to do is tie into the force main at Thin Wells Road, pump up to that gravity outlet and put all the houses on public sewer. We did go through an analysis of that and confirm that it was technically feasible. Uh, we even went and applied with the council for a conditional approval uh, for uh, extending the, I'm sorry, for approval to extend the sewer zone to include this parcel. As some of you may remember, this parcel was not included in the uh, sewer service area, so we needed to go through the council approval. And my understanding is that was granted, I think, two weeks ago, Maureen, or a week ago, August 9th. August 9th. Um, so we have uh, made that change. Uh, we've actually uh, revised the subdivision plan to elimin eliminate the septic system locations and have um, added the public sewer. We would ask, because we were able to make this change not until the 9th when we got approval, uh, we would ask that the planning board make as a condition uh, of the approval that we provide the revised plan and profile showing the details of the sewer design so that the town engineer and the public works director can review it and make sure that we're following what they need to. Um, with that, we're here tonight, hopefully, uh, to go through the public hearing process and move forward with the uh, uh, final plan approval of the project. I know that uh, Maureen, just a couple of last items, uh, Maureen passed out to us a copy of a memo from uh, the public works director and from the town engineer. I believe there was a suggestion about possibly shifting the road about 50 feet or so. Um, I guess that would be easterly direction 
and then coming in from there, this would allow us to eliminate the wetlands impact pretty much all together. Uh, the memos, uh, the response, or the information provided by the town engineer and public works director uh, essentially indicate that when you offset when, from a design standpoint, from a traffic flow standpoint, you really don't like to offset the intersection because it creates uh, conflicts with vehicles and turning movements, stacking, queuing, and most ordinances actually force you, either you're several, a hundred, couple, 200 feet away or so, or you're right across from the other one. Uh, in this case, we're right across the street. We have provided uh, some signs because there is the sidewalk in our development will link to the sidewalk directly across the street from Cross Hill. So we're going to put a crosswalk in, and uh, the town engineer suggested uh, that we put some signage indicating a pedestrian crossing. Uh, for vehicles moving along the Wells Road, but from a planning sense, from a design, from a traffic movement, um, it, it really is best to have those intersections aligned uh, within the project. Uh, the project will also include street trees um, as required by the ordinance at 40-foot intervals along the road coming in. Uh, also, we indicated two trees within the cul-de-sac. I know during the site walk there was some discussion about uh, potentially uh, not having trees or or changing that just because of the view corridor um, out into the marsh. I, I think the idea behind the trees and the street was is that this is an open field. It defines the road. It provides shade uh, within the road, and it really provides a nice entry. There's enough drop and elevation across the site. Um, uh, it's almost uh, 30 to 40 feet by the time you get down to the lower end of the site, so you're up higher on the Wells Road, so you will maintain that visual corridor. The trees, of course, over years will get high, but it will take quite a while for that to happen. Um, so we've left the trees on, on the plan. Uh, we've included a couple trees in the cul-de-sac. If the board uh, desires to change that, we're certainly willing to do that, but uh, right now we do have the trees on the plan. Uh, the plan up here also shows the building windows for each of the lots. The lots are large lots. The smallest lot is 80, 000, just over 80,000 square feet or two acres, with the largest lot approximately four acres in size. We've configured the building windows to uh, stay out of the floodplain, uh, to follow the wetlands where, where appropriate, especially uh, up here on lot one. Also, there's a drainage easement that goes down through the site. Uh, the town engineer, one of the comments the town engineer had was they asked us to look at hydraulically using two culverts for the roadway crossing versus one. You may have seen that in there. We've changed the plans for that. That had to do with the height of cover over a culvert. Typically, you like to have a couple of feet of cover over the culvert, and going to two smaller ones accommodated that. Uh, the fire chief also uh, approved this on our private access, access way easement not having the hammerhead turnaround because uh, we're so close to the cul-de-sac, he felt that that was sufficient. And I believe there's uh, mention of that in the staff report. With that, we're here to answer any questions and hopefully move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we go to the public hearing and then uh, we can ask some additional questions if necessary. So I'd like to open the public hearing on this application. And if anyone would like to speak, please Come up to the podium and introduce yourself, and we'd be happy to listen to you. And if not, we have a quick public hearing. Anyone wish to speak? Okay. We'll close the public hearing then. Mr. McCullough, you can get right back up there. <laughs> Questions? Did, well... Barbara. I would like to say that uh, three others of us did go today and met with Maureen and walked the site. And um, we discussed the possibility of actually requiring you to move the lot lines on the rear two lots beyond the cul-de-sac, have 50-foot setbacks from the lot lines on each one of those so that that view can be better maintained than it is. Those building lots are so large and people are not likely to build their houses there anyway. I mean, they have so much room to build in those areas. It would give everybody a better view to the marsh 
And I'm afraid I have to say that this is a gorgeous piece of land. There's nothing wrong with the subdivision. It's very nice, but you're ruining an absolutely magnificent view. And I really feel very strongly about that. There's not much we can do except to say that there are a few of us who feel very sad to see the view go away and large houses being built on that parcel. But we, at least I would like to discuss moving those lot lines a little further apart so that we have a larger view corridor. And that being said, we do appreciate all the efforts made by this applicant to address the board's concerns. Just so you understand, the, the 50 foot setback is only with respect to the uh, western property line of lot three and the eastern property line of lot four. So it would just be enlarging that corridor, that view, uh, to help preserve the view of the marsh uh, from the end of the cul-de-sac and also from Wells Road. Well, since I wasn't at the, since I was at the official site walk <laughs> and not the unofficial one, I didn't, uh, I didn't hear this proposal. So maybe somebody can show me on the plan. Or, Owens, do you understand what the proposal is? Well, I think can I'm going to point and see if I can work my way through it to make sure I do understand. I think we're referring to this property line right here. Correct. And increasing this setback from, I believe, 30 feet to 50 feet and increasing this setback from 30 feet to 50 feet on this side of the property. Correct. Right? That's exactly right. Um, I, all I would add is that uh, Joel Fitzpatrick uh, from Wiley Enterprises fully intends to uh, develop these, sell these lots and develop them as a package. He, that's what he does. He, he builds the houses as part of the development. And during the whole planning, I know he has been very conscious about how the subdivision looks and the view corridors. I, I would have to hear from him if he has any concerns with increasing the setbacks. But I do know that uh, when he goes to build the houses, he's spoken many times about looking at each lot and developing houses specific for each lot. And when he cites the houses, citing them all in a manner that will preserve a view quarter as much as he can down through the site. If we increase those setbacks uh, to 50 feet, I'm not so sure it would be a big impact on this lot, but that pushes this lot down and this house over on, on this lot. And I know the goal is to try to preserve some views from the various lots uh, out over the marsh. Uh, you know, maybe one approach uh, would be that as he begins to site the houses on the, on the properties, uh, that maybe he could show them to the town planner. I'm trying to keep as flexible as we can in the building windows on the lots and respect the request to preserve view corridors. I, I don't know if the board would be willing, and one option is maybe Joel could work with the planner when he gets his houses set for those lots to review that specific location to see if there were opportunities to, to preserve that view corridor. Um, one thought, and I think at this point, I will let Joel speak to this because this is probably more relevant to, to how he feels about it. Yeah, Barbara. I just want to add one thing. We were only talking about things that were over, I believe, two feet in height, so that if, if seven or two feet. No, no, not 18. Two, wasn't it two feet we were? I, I don't know. We, we, in, the, in the field, we talked two feet. In the draft motion, I said three feet. Okay, three feet. That's so that if you needed to put a driveway in or you needed, you wanted to put some low shrubbery in or um, wanted to put, I don't know, something that wasn't very high there. We're just thinking about the view okay. and the house, not so much other things that might go on it. A tennis court, which might impede in there. Or sure. Whatever. So I better like to speak. Well, Joel Fitzpatrick, the owner of the property. Uh, as Owens uh, stated about these lots, this, this lot number four, that probably wouldn't be such a big deal. This one here, it, uh, another 20 feet, it makes this pretty much unusable, so the house would have to be moved 
down into the field. I'm always thinking it should the home should be up a little ways. Um, so this one, I, this one, I would have a problem with that, uh, just for citing the house for aesthetics. Uh, I, I don't think it would work. I don't think that that it would work with what you're trying to do. I think something that would work uh, if we do 50 feet from this line over, and maybe take these trees and we do some low shrubs or something low instead of big canopy uh, maples that's shown, and these three here are big canopy maples. Uh, so this, these, these five trees, we we might want to do something else with 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 the, with the tree plantings. Uh, but as far as the setback goes, uh, if we could kind of have a compromise on that. What's the impact for you of that moving the moving the setback 250 feet for that lower lot there? Well, we have right now, this is this is 30 feet, so another 20 or so would be down to here, which leaves me in this little, this is the building envelope here now with this green. So it'll it'll skinny it up, which is, makes it pretty much unusable for a garage or, or anything, you know. It, it forces me to push the house down, down the field, probably. Is that a problem? 100 feet, uh, 75 feet or so. <laughs> Joel, how much lower is that piece of land that we're talking about than the cul-de-sac? Uh, Owens, uh, if, you, if, you, if you go by the, the uh, topo here, we've got, what, a 25 to 30 foot drop from yeah, here. It's, it's 46 to 26 on mine, so it's a, it's a good 20 feet. Right. So we might, you know, one being at that cul-de-sac, uh, the only thing that would impede him, that person, would be the anything over 26 feet high off the grade level. Right. So I'm not sure that that would bother me at this point. I, I would, I wouldn't recommend changing that <coughs> to 50 feet. I think it would be easy on lot number four, but, but I wouldn't be in favor of doing it on lot number three. I think it restricts the builder and the potential siting of the house. I, I certainly appreciate the applicant's willingness to change the lot line for lot four. Maybe with lot three, we could have the unintended consequence of trying to improve a view corridor, but having the house placed in an awkward position that might be worse, frankly, than the way the applicant might be placing it now. So I, I agree with David. It will be my full intent to, uh, the more of the view corridor we keep, the, the happier my customers, well, customers will be here also. Um, so that is my full intent. Of course, there is no guarantee something could happen to me and someone else builds on it, but uh, that is my full intent. Like I said, I, the, the, these, uh, I think, will impede the view more than, than anything else, trees, as far as being in the middle of a cultic set. Yeah, as, as you know, I wasn't a big fan of the trees for that reason, but uh, I guess my view on the other lot is that the, the elevation is such that actually from the road you would only see top third or less um, of a house, not even that much. Um, I'd like to discuss a little bit because this is new, well, fairly new to me, the, the issue of the sewer. Uh, I know that when, when we did the original site walk, there were some reasons why sewer was not considered feasible. What, what changed in the meantime? When, when we walked the site, um, oh, it sort of goes back in time. This site wasn't in, originally in the sewer service area. Right. Uh, the soils work that was done on the site was good. Uh, the soils were perfectly suitable for septic systems. And we knew that if we did pursue public sewer, we would have to put 
uh, pump station in, you know, the individual houses with a force main pumped up to another force main. Uh, the primary concern with that is generally if you can get sewer by gravity, that's the preference. And in this case, we would have been able to achieve that with on-site septic systems. Um, I had some original concerns about technically how that sewer would connect into the four inch and convey the wastewater from the lot up to the sanitary sewer. Um, when it became apparent that there was some interest, some, some pretty strong interest to go to public sewer on this parcel, we took it one step further and actually went through the design process to size the pumps. We spoke with the E1 manufacturer who ran it through their engineers and their analysis and it, it took the better part of a week to go through that but what came back was that yes it was technically feasible so at that point uh, the applicant uh, knew had a comfort level knowing that yes he could do it sewer or do it septic frankly septic systems were the applicants preference but there was it seemed to be a lot of interest uh, the town manager had expressed interest in trying to put this in the sewer service area and I think some board members had some concerns about septic and proximity to the marsh, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, we actually met with the town manager at one point and discussed this with him. Uh, the applicant uh, felt he was doing, uh, I would think, the, I would have to say the right thing or at least the thing that he thought was of most interest to the town, which was to put this site on sewer. He would have much rather preferred to stay on septic but was under the understanding that public sewer was preferable for this parcel. So we did our due diligence, determined that it would work, um, and then went through the process of getting it in the sewer service area. That's sort of how we got here. Well, given, at least in my mind, given the sensitive nature of the land that's down gradient, uh, certainly I think the sewer system is, is a good way to go. So I would endorse that change. Yes, Jack. Um, during the site walk today, um, some of us inquired about the possibility of the road coming into the development be along the existing gravel road that already takes, takes it in there um, to preserve the wetlands that would have to be filled for this, for this roadway. Um, and that raised the question among us about what the safety impacts are for having the road be offset from the road coming down to Cross Hill. And so um, I did a little research when I got home just to see what I could find, and it was a little bit surprising to me. I found a Federal Highway Administration document which includes a literature search about these topics, uh, and it refers to a document by Hanna et al. that says, for four-leg intersections, Offset intersections had accident rates that were approximately 43% of the accident rate of conventional four-leg intersections. In other words, 57% lower than a conventional four-leg intersection. And it says the finding may indicate that where there is little through traffic on the crossroads, two T intersections operate more safely than one conventional four-leg intersection. Um, in addition, the other, and I did not, I didn't, try to be selective about what I put in here. I, mm -hmm. I found these things and they're not, they're not selected because they support any, any point of view or not. Another document from an engineering company says the cross intersection, the four leg, this is an engineering company in Santa Barbara, California, Austin, the four leg type of intersection preferred by Americans has been out of favor for many years in other countries because of its high accident rate. Sweden has not used cross intersections in new construction for at least 15 years. The United Kingdom does not recommend cross intersections in new construction. To reduce accidents, the UK converts existing cross intersections to offset intersections and roundabouts. It recommends offset intersections for light crossing flows and roundabouts for heavy crossing flows. So the things that I found uh, all added up to it actually being safer when there's an offset between those two roads coming in. Um, 
the we had, I guess, an email from DPW Director Bob Malley indicating his feeling that it was safer this way, but I couldn't find anything to support that. I, I wonder if if those documents, and I'm I haven't read them, not familiar yeah. with them. I my experience with DOT, other municipal engineers, has been that if if you are going to offset them, you need to offset them by a substantial enough distance so that you don't get the cross traffic that is created if you only offset, say, 50 feet. If you offset 50 feet, a vehicle turning out of one intersection, the tendency for people to drive up to intersections is to look forward, left, right. and right, and then make their turning movement. If there's another vehicle that comes up to the other intersection, and they make that move, and you make that move, that can create problems. If they're mm -hmm. offset a substantial enough dif distance, mm -hmm. then what happens is uh, there's, there's reaction time to react to that other vehicle that comes out. And I'm not familiar with those, if, if there was any specific guidelines. Yeah, I would have to dig deeper into the referred to study yeah. to know what the, what the different kinds of intersections that were studied actually involved if I was offset. I don't know the answer to that. Most municipal ordinances, and Maureen, I don't have it with me, so you, it, maybe you can help Including me. Including ours. It has Perverse. a specific requirement yeah. that you can't have intersections within a certain distance of each other unless they're directly across. And I think that has to do with getting enough physical separation so you, so you avoid that, that conflict of just a slight offset. I, so I don't know that I disagree with what is said in those documents, I, but I suspect somewhere underlined there might be... A well, I think in both cases they talk about the offset intersection being preferred when the cross flow is a light flow, and that would be the case. Most of the flow out of both Cross Hill and out of this subdivision would be to come to Wells Road and mm -hmm. turn left to right, rather than going across from Cross Hill into the subdivision and vice versa. Oh. Interesting. Thank you. Dave. Well, when I also made the sidewalk today, sorry I didn't make the okay. first one. I sorry. apologize. I should have come this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel strongly about a, a four way intersection. And the other issue here that is important to talk about you're talking about a subdivision with only five homes in it mm -hmm. and a roadway that's entering. Um, another roadway that is got a speed limit in the 30 mile per hour range with five homes turning into that highway with a well that roadway with an offset like that i don't think is a concern i grew up on a four-way intersection like that we had a small neighborhood turning on to a road like wells road and we had several cross accidents there and they were caused by the fact that somebody would come down Cross Hill Road and be looking at the neighborhood, seeing how nice that is, coming to that intersection, not seeing the stop sign and cross that intersection and being hit broadside. And there was one accident with three deaths in that accident. And I could certainly agree with the town engineer and also Mr. Malley if we had road with track roads here with traffic similar on all four legs and we don't we've got a little tiny subdivision with five homes in it mm -hmm. and and then add to that that you re, that we're requiring the contractor to fill wetlands what we which we don't like to see build a uh, a, a wall as a barrier and uh, i'd be in favor very strongly of allowing the road to come in the way it is presently there now that we saw today. And for those reasons, I think we talk about hazardous, and I think a four-way intersection in this location is very hazardous. And uh, I, I, I would not be in favor of that change. Okay. Uh. I, I, I certainly appreciate the arguments and issues that uh, David and Jack have raised, but I'm just not willing to make a recommendation that deviates from what the town engineer and uh, public works director have recommended that we do at this intersection. Uh, so I would actually be in favor of uh, the plan as proposed by the applicant. Well, 
I guess one thing that we, we should and need to look at is, is our own subdivision ordinance, which does state that road jogs at intersections with center line offsets of less than 125 feet shall be avoided. Um, and I think that goes to your point of while offset intersections may be preferable at certain distances from each other, uh, whoever drafted our ordinance, presumably with some study and logic behind it, felt that 125 feet, anything closer than that, uh, was not preferable to have offset intersections. And uh, if, if somebody can convince me that our ordinance is wrong or based on faulty information, then uh, I'd, I'd be happy to consider changing this and perhaps changing our ordinance. But it would seem to me that there can't be a there can't be a, uh, a black and white in terms of offsets and, and aligned intersections without considering how close they are together. And certainly, the closer they are together, the more uh, potential there is for a safety traffic problem. And the further apart, there's less of a there's less of a potential for that. So, you know, there's our ordinance does address the issue pretty clearly. And I'd have to be convinced that our ordinance is wrong or there's something different about this intersection. Yeah. John, the, um, I, I think the sentence that he refers to says the road jogs at, inter road jogs at intersections with center line offsets less than 120 feet shall be avoided. It doesn't, doesn't the way I read that is that, is that we, we're not bound by that. In this particular case, my argument is that we've got a very tiny subdivision with five homes in it, very few cars driving in and out of that. And the, the term shall be avoided doesn't necessarily tell me that we shall not allow them. I think we've got well, some flexibility here. So, and that's the way I look at it. Well, I guess... All I'm saying is I, I'm not a traffic engineer, and I don't think any of us here are. And uh, I guess I'm not willing to uh, go contrary. And to me, I mean, in my reading, when something says shall, that usually means that's the way you're supposed to do it when you look at any statutes or ordinances. But uh, for me to change that, I'd have to be convinced that we're not making a un unsafe condition or a condition that isn't isn't as safe. And and I mean, uh, Dave, the next sentence says at intersections and common boundaries, roads shall be continuous and in alignment with existing roads if possible. So you know, there, there's there's got to be re good reason behind that. And I would still contend that the closer the two roads are to each other, the more potential there is for for traffic safety issues. Now, you know, again, we're all, I think we're all making judgments based on our own common sense and logic, but uh, a traffic engineer could address this, but I assume did when the ordinance was drafted. I mean, there, there's, you know, there's got to be a reason for it. Maureen, do you know what what the genesis of this is, or what's happened in prior applications? Well, as you pointed out, I'm not a traffic engineer, but all my understandings basically follow what Owen just said, where, you know, if, if you think of Shore Road up here and how you, you almost have two intersections with Scott Dyer Road and um, Route 77 intersecting um, with Shore Road, it's always been difficult up there in terms of trying to find a way to regulate that intersection. It's difficult for pedestrians. Clearly, that's a busy intersection compared to this one. But yes, our ordinance has always contemplated, and we have typically required that roads have to be across the street from each other whenever possible. Um, the Whaleback Ridge project, we require the applicant to be directly across from Trundy Road. 
um, and there is the separation of 125 feet, as you've pointed out, again, because usually when you have a road, the, the highest likelihood for accidents is when you're having turning mo movements into and out of that road. So if you have them very close together, there's a lot of activity going on at that one place, and it increases the likelihood that people are going to end up hitting each other. If you put them all at one location, as Owen said, people tend to look straight ahead, right and left. You, 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 you discipline people to look in certain directions in order to enter lanes safely. Barbara. Well, this afternoon in looking at the site, I, I too was in favor of leaving the road the way it is. Now I'm sort of in between the two, but I, I think that I would go ahead and leave it the way it is simply because neither the town engineer nor the public works director, they are, seem rather strong in their responses to us. So I, I guess I just have to leave it the way it is at this point, not knowing whether, because the offset was only about 50 feet or 60 feet. We're not talking about a very big one. We really have more of an S than a, than a definitive street and then another street coming in at another point. And maybe that is more dangerous. I don't know that any of us could say it is or it isn't. I wonder, I'd like to know the origin or genesis of our own regulations because I know uh, when I lived in Maryland before I moved, that was right before I came to Cape Elizabeth, it was a new development, brand new development, and they were purposely putting small offsets in, and I actually asked them, well, why are you doing that? And they said, because the studies show that it makes drivers more aware of the fact they were at an intersection, that they're offset. So they claimed that was safer down there, too. And those are, they were like 20 and 30 feet, well, maybe 50 foot offsets, but small, very small offsets. Well, I mean, not to beat the dead horse here, but, but we've all seen the traffic study for the town center and Shore Road, and the traffic engineer in that study is fairly adamant that uh, 77 should, I mean, um, Shore Road should line up. Yeah, that's for, a little for, different from this situation, a lot different from this situation. Well, in terms of, in terms of degree it is, yeah. but in terms of the actual placement it isn't. It's the same. The offset is too close together and their recommendation is they should, they should be aligned. So, you know, again, uh, I, I would rather rely on the, the recommendations of the people who do this for a living and it seems like when it's less than 125 feet, they'd rather have it aligned. I mean, subdivisions over the past 15 years, uh, you know, that have had a number of traffic studies. Every time that I can recall that we've had traffic studies done, the traffic engineer would always recommend if it was across the street from an intersection to align it. And I have not, I have not experienced any any deviation from that, at, at least in the traffic and the engineering community within this area. Um, and I know that Bob Malley and Steve Harding, who are both practicing engineers, and I know both of them have dealt with traffic a lot, felt pretty strongly, uh, at least from reading their memos, that, that you want to keep it aligned. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. To yeah. switch gears very quickly, Thank Maureen you. had prepared a draft condition on the uh, this corridor and changing the uh, setback okay. requirement for lot four. But one of the items that you listed as an example of what might be permissible in in the setback area what was was a tennis court. But if there's a tennis court, I assume there's got to be a fence, and if there's a fence, that would be something that's above three feet. So. Uh, when you said tennis court, were you just meaning the court without the fence? Okay, so should, I was just going to... And they would align it sideways with the mat away from the feet, set back area. Okay. But these are good eight-foot fences around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say, if, 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 assuming we put that condition in, we'll just uh, delete tennis courts. Okay. Okay. Well... Yeah. All right, but let's go back to that. I, I thought now we were 
to set the cheat. Are we talking about lot? Yeah, are we All we're talking about, about is lot four. Lot, lot four. four. Lot four, I'm sorry. Lot four, right. I think we're talking about moving the setback to 50 feet on lot four, which I, I took a scale earlier, which is about the edge of that green line right there on lot four and moving it up there. And then not doing anything with Leave. lot three because of the elevation. That seems like a fair compromise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we're all on board with that. Motion. Um, any other discussion or questions? Anybody else want to say anything about the, the street trees? I just think it, it impedes the, the view, but I roundly outvoted. So anyway, all right. Finding no support, I know when to retreat. No, no, no support for what? <laughs> Oh, the street trees. Yeah, I don't like street trees. Okay. We have a motion? Sure. A motion for the board to consider uh, findings of fact. One, Wiley Enterprises LLC is requesting minor subdivision review, a resource protection permit, and a private access way permit for autumn tides, a five lot subdivision proposed off Wells Road, R5 33, which requires review for compliance with section 16 2 3. Minor Subdivision Review, Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit, and Section 19-7-9, Private Access Way Permit. Two, the town engineer has recommended technical changes to the plans to bring them into compliance with town design standards. Three, the project will include public improvements for which a performance guarantee should be provided. Four, the Town Council has voted to expand the sewer service area to include this lot. Five, the plan substantially comply, actually insert the new draft finding of fact is number five. Uh, the view from Wells Road to the Stroh Inc. Marsh is the number one priority view in the visual assessment report in accordance with section 16-3-1P. Uh, structures should be prohibited from obstructing the scenic vista to the Spurwink Marsh. Five, the plans substantially comply with the subdivision ordinance, resource protection permit standards, and private access way permit standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and material submitted and the facts presented, the application of Wiley Enterprises LLC for minor subdivision review, a resource protection permit, and a private access way permit for autumn tides a five lot subdivision located off Wells Road, R5-33, across from Cross Hill Road be approved, subject to the following conditions. Uh, one, that the plans be revised per the town engineer's comments in his letter dated August 9th, 2004. Two, that a performance guarantee be posted in an amount approved by the town engineer, a form approved by the town attorney, and all to be approved by the town manager. Three, that plans showing public sewer connection for all lots be submitted and approved by the town engineer and the public works director. Four, that the deeds be reviewed and approved by the town attorney. Five, that the building envelope be set back 50 feet from the eastern property line of lot four to protect the view corridor visible from the cul-de-sac to the Spurwink Marsh. Within the view corridor, driveways, structures, such as, but not limited to, decorative rock walls that do not exceed three feet in height from grade will be allowed. Landscaping or anything else that would exceed three feet, three feet in height from original grade is not permitted. And six, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of building permits until the above conditions have been met and the plan has been signed and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. I have a correction. Please. It's not the western property line of Lot 4. It's the eastern property line of Lot 4. That's what he Look says. At he said eastern. Yeah. Look, at your, eastern. Look at your... Look at your... West... The... It is a, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, you know what? It is the western. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm thinking of the other lot. Thank you very much. Hmm? Never mind. Okay, correction is withdrawn. <laughs> uh, do we have a second to the motion? 
Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, next issue is Cape, Cape Elizabeth Family Medicine Edition request for site plan review of a 1,400 square foot addition located at 1226 Shore Road, and this is here for a determination of site plan completeness. Mr. Wilcox. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening, uh, Dr. Johnson and I uh, would like to uh, present the changes to the plans since our initial submission, uh, and then uh, leave uh, to the board the discussion of the completeness of the plans. There have been uh, several uh, substantive changes uh, which have been incorporated into the plans in, in the design uh, in, in addition to the, uh, some of the uh, technical items which were addressed in the uh, description of the plan. The most significant uh, change has been the addition of uh, landscaping along the east property line of the parcel, uh, including a landscape berm at the, at the north end uh, of the property line. Uh, the landscaping uh, consisting of uh, mainly different species of evergreen trees. Uh, another change uh, which has been incorporated uh, has been uh, the removal of the existing hemlock trees at the back of the parking lot along with the uh, uh, fence, which is the existing fence at those trees, which is in dilapidated condition. Uh, those uh, landscape elements being uh, replaced by the buffer, which does ex which extends uh, down past the park, down to the parking lot along the east property line. Uh, another change that has uh, been incorporated has been a uh, slight expansion of the parking lot 
uh, as a result of realigning uh, the garage and moving it to the new location where it is right where it's shown right now, uh, the minimum number of parking spaces for the floor area of the building needed to be accommodated, and the addition of the parking spaces shown on the plan at this time now accommodate that need. Uh, the existing the parking garage has also, in its relocation, uh, been sited so that it uh, this does not intrude upon what is right now uh, sort of a silt basin uh, for the drainage culverts that cross under the road. Uh, the garage design itself has been changed also. Uh, the, instead of a large oversized uh, structure, uh, it is a two-car garage, sort of a basic two-car garage, uh, the, the, uh, and a, a separate trash room uh, beside the two-car garage. The story is, is also uh, two structures, two stories, excuse me, in the garage portion. Uh, the other change that has been added to the plans uh, is further detail of the sewage pumping station, uh, which would be in the area in between the, the front of the addition and Shore Road. Uh, this uh, structure has been uh, designed to be, uh, well, it's basically completely underground and has been designed with a pump that meets uh, water district standards. Uh, and those are the, the changes which have been incorporated uh, in addition to uh, responses to uh, the comments from the last presentation. Um, Mr. Wilcox, uh, as you remember last time, the application was determined not to be complete. If you could just review quickly the things that have been submitted that addressed uh, those issues so we're all familiar with, with what we have and how that's been addressed. Surely. With regard to completeness, uh, the items which were submitted uh, included a, uh, a statement of professional and technical ability, uh, a statement about the intention of their of trash to uh, basically be stored either in the building or in the new storage building, not in a, in a dumpster on the site, uh, a statement of financial uh, capacity uh, from Town Manager McGovern, uh, and further clarification on uh, the exterior lighting fixtures, which are planned to be used, uh, ones uh, changing from ones which have uh, visible glass diffusers uh, to ones where basically it's not possible to see the lamp inside the fixture. And the drainage information? And the, the drainage information, uh, basically the entire garage is a different, different design and so that's project in, in response to, now. to that. Uh, there was, uh, the silted area uh, was field measured, uh, not surveyed, but it's very obvious if you uh, go into the thicket there. Uh, the, uh, the culverts have an area that's uh, on the order of uh, a little over 20 feet wide by maybe 40 feet long of a shallow depression uh, in the earth right now where silt has accumulated largely coming uh, from the parking lot. Right here, uh, that parking lot uh, drains down the corner uh, to an inlet structure. Uh, and uh, when it rains, the sand and the 
on the parking lot. You know, some of it gets, every time it rains, some of it gets carried down into the culverts. Uh, over the years, uh, a good amount of it has not only accumulated in the culverts, but it's uh, shown on the site plan. There's a uh, uh, sort of a, a slightly sloping area where the silt has collected uh, amidst the underbrush uh, in this area right here. The, uh, the garage was sited uh, so that uh, a silt fence uh, eight feet away from the garage, allowing construction of the garage to be on the uphill side of the silt fence, uh, would still be outside of the silted area that exists right now. Okay, just to remind the board that our consideration at this point is on completeness and issues on completeness should be addressed if we determine it to be incomplete. That'll end the discussion. If we determine the application to be complete, we can then move on to a substantive discussion. Um, I certainly want to address the issue of the violation of our prior approval. I don't think, however, that's an issue of completeness, so we can get to that later. Barbara. I have a motion for the board to consider. All right. Um, motion for the board to consider be in order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dr. Dave Johnson to construct a 1,543 square foot addition to the existing medical office building and two-car garage located at 1226 Shore Road be deemed complete. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay. The application is deemed complete. Um, another thing we need to discuss is uh, site walk and public hearing. Uh, I guess it would be my view that both would be a good idea in this case. Does anybody disagree? There have been some concerns from abutters and so forth. Um, so we'll, we should schedule that. Might as well. Um, that one evening didn't work too well, but what's the what's the board's preference in terms of time of day? My preference would be to do it first thing in the morning, if that would be acceptable to the town planner and the applicant, rather than on a, mentioning on the weekend. On a weekend on a, or weekday? On a weekday morning. Weekday? That's fine with me. Early. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Now we have that. How about the day? Next week? Next week? Some morning next week? Monday, Wednesday. Okay, we're narrowing it down. <laughs> Some morning next week. <laughs> um, Wednesday. I won't be here. You, you won't be here at all next week. I hope you. Are. How about Monday? <laughs> well, we we hope you are, Barbara. Well, I hope I'm here. <laughs> How about Monday? Monday. Monday's not. I have a what? standing meeting at 8 a.m. on Mondays. I could probably do a Tuesday morning early, maybe. How about Tuesday? Tuesday. Mr. Wilcox is shaking his head. Yes, okay. What's Tuesday. Time? How early do we want to go? I'm 7.30. 7.30. And as usual, Maureen, I'll ask you to remind me with an email. <laughs> Preferably before 7 on Tuesday morning. Okay. Um, do we want to have any further discussion or? Yes. Go ahead. I'm just wondering if it makes sense to hold off on the discussion of the items until we have the public hearing and we've done the site walk. Especially in light of the rather full agenda we have. We do. Jack. Yeah, I, I had given that, you know, Bruce, Bruce has uh, cited them for a violation of the previous approval. We have a letter here from Peter and Alice Rand relative to um, new buffer. 
and they've made a request to us that we do something to ensure that the new planting is done within the next month. And I worry that if we don't do anything until the public hearing, that's a full month expired by then. So, mm -hmm. can we do something in concert with the applicant to ensure that the buffer is put in place within the next month? The applicant would like to consider this if it is possible. Uh, braiding, landscaping, I think typically is not a requirement, is not an activity which triggers site plan review. However, building the berm, uh, being grading, is probably something that does require oh, site plan review. If, if you could tell us, we have a violation possible, which we would be interested too. Well, it, it, I guess we need to get into this issue, and to me the issue is pretty clear. Um, we had a requirement on the prior approval that uh, prohibited taking out vegetation in that particular area except for certain conditions. Uh, vegetation was taken out in that particular area that did not meet those conditions and therefore is a violation of the plan. Now, uh, we can address that by asking you to, uh, to correct those violations, and we can table the whole application until that's done. Now, I don't think that would work with your schedule or be preferable, but certainly I think the applicant can simultaneously address the violations now to assist the, uh, the neighbors in replacing the buffer that should not have been removed and at the same time we can review the new application uh, without, without delaying that. So to me that's not too much to ask to have the applicant basically attempt to address um, the buffer issue which uh, needs to be addressed and which shouldn't have been removed in the first place prior to the time when it would normally be done uh, in connection with this application. And the reason for that is that that requirement is not a requirement of this application. That was a requirement of the prior approval. So I see that, I see that differently as something that will, can be done at the end of the period of construction of this application. So I think it should be done. I think the buffer should be restored to the extent possible so that the neighbors do not have to be open to the uh, construction during the construction period when had the violation not occurred, they would have been protected any, anyway. And I guess, speaking for myself, if, if it isn't done and the violation isn't addressed, um, when the application comes back, then I guess we have other alternatives. But I would hope we wouldn't have to deal with it anymore and we can just get it, get it rectified. Anybody else want to speak on that, Dave? Well, also, I, I, I think that the code enforcement officer handled it very well to give us the chance to proceed on this project so that they could get approval to go ahead. He gave them an opportunity to live with the situation until we got the, first, the final approval. But if he doesn't take care of it at that point, then he will proceed. Do you have, do you have any questions on that? I, I would request a clarification. Uh, is it the board's intention that where we're now showing evergreen trees, that you wish us to replant chokeberry bushes, and then come to the board for permission to remove the chokeberry bushes and plant the evergreen trees? Because if your language says restore the original buffer, most of what was re removed in terms of understory planting 
was in the area that was designated to be cleared. And some deciduous bushes, choke berries, privets, and whatnot were also errantly removed by the site work contractor. If you wish, that, I'm, I would just like to understand what it is you're requesting. Well, I, I, I think what it comes down to is if if the landscaping buffer that you proposed, which everybody appears to think will be sufficient, and I think is sufficient, can be accelerated so that that not only goes along with the addition that you're planning to do, but can also address the uh, buffer now that should be there, then that should be done. It's just a matter of doing it sooner rather than later. I don't think anyone's suggesting that the, the buffering plan needs to be changed or done more than once, okay. but it would certainly be helpful to the neighbors if that could be done now or soon as opposed to at the end of construction for the reasons that they've, they've stated. Uh, Dr. Johnson has met with the immediate about her and uh, there is interest in proceeding uh, with establishing the buffer. Uh, would we be able to have the board's permission to perform grading operations uh, in advance of site plan approval? Mr. Wilcox, are you, in your estimate, would you be grading less than 10,000 square feet? Definitely then you do not need any approval to do that as long as your regrading does not increase drainage onto other properties. Excellent. Thank you. So does that, does that answer, your, answer your question? Yes. And yep. do you, is that something you think that can be at least begun? Is there... Yep. Okay. Do you consider it a hardship to wait another month to have a site marking? Uh, yes. Uh, it would also be good at this point then to have some discussion about the town engineer's comment, which I have uh, uh, is not uh, unheard of in that, in that uh, one of the uh, trees which has been proposed for the buffer is uh, in unreliable supply. Uh, it's, sometimes it's possible to get Canadian hemlocks, sometimes it's not. Uh, there has been for a few years now an insect infestation and uh, any uh, plant material that uh, comes into the country from Canada or actually basically gets shipped anywhere needs to be certified uh, that it's free uh, of this insect. It has, uh, and it has put a a, a damper somewhat on the on the supplies of this material. Wow. So are you, are you proposing a, an alternative if you can't obtain that? I, are, I read that, but I don't remember the specific. Right. There are, there are other uh, materials also in the buffer going down the property line, uh, including pine tree, two different species of pine trees and a uh, species of fir tree and a spruce tree. Uh, if it would be deemed equivalent uh, to, to substitute the spruce and the fir if the hemlock is not available, uh, that would be something that we would be able to, uh, to do. That seems reasonable. Barbara? I think if the hemlock is subject, and I don't, I'm not a, anybody who knows anything about trees, but if it is subject to insects, then I don't think we want that in the buffer. I mean, I think that would be negative rather than positive, and it should be substituted. Well, I think that's more before the fact. If it is, then you can't get them, right? I mean, uh, uh, I don't know. We the area, the most sensitive part of the hem of the uh, of the buffer, uh, exists in an area that is shaded by tall oak trees, and. Uh, it would be preferable, uh, the, uh, the, the, the hemlock would be the best, it can grow in the shade. Uh, it's also the largest diameter and the bushiest, and the infestation has 
basically gone up the east coast through New Hampshire, and we're sort of about at the northern edge of, of its zone. Uh, but the uh, balsam fir and the Colorado green spruce uh, also, also uh, are adaptable to uh, filtered light, low light, uh, but not, they're not total shade plants, but right. they're, they're a sort of sunshade type plant, and, and they'd, have a chance, they'd have a better chance than the pines. Uh, well, I mean, I'm comfortable that if they can get them, fine, and if they can't, there's an alternative. Mm -hmm. they, they've all been designated on the plan in the, in the same height range. They're not small bucket plants. They're all six feet, right. seven feet high, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's fine. Well, the question becomes, do we reverse the site walk and continue the discussion now? But because you asked the question about hardship. Mm. I'm not sure where we are. Well, well, I, 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 no, I, I mean, it seems to me we're going to have to have a public hearing given the yeah. concerns that have been raised. So I don't know, hardship or not, I don't know how we expedite this. Well, it, as Mr. Wilcox knows, we, it's certainly possible to have the public hearing and have the discussion, discussion and approval the same night. So that, that's not going to create a time difficulty. I think if I'm reading Dave's question correctly, it was to wait to see what the buffer looks like right, right for the site walk. Um, I, that's not a bad idea. I don't see how it would and delay anything. But and with the change of the with the allowance of under 10,000 square feet, you still can get some work done. So, yeah. what, what, do we, what do you feel about that? I think it's a good idea to wait until the buffer is complete. All right, Maureen, what's, our, what's the schedule for the next? When would be the meeting with the public hearing? The uh, September 21st meeting. Okay. So, do you want to have a site walk? Closer to September 21st. Is that what we're? Is that where we're going? Well, I thought that that if we had it sooner, then people could, then the applicant perhaps could get started even on the landscaping. Well, they can. I don't think they need the site walk to do that. But I guess the only they, they don't need the site walk. But the only thing is, if we had, I know from past experience when we have a site walk close to the meeting kind of like what happened with the prior applicant, and we have substantive comments. They don't really have time to, to react to them and address them. And so that's the flip side, although it certainly wouldn't hurt to see where things stand at that point. What if I, we were could, to do I could go either way. So. I mean, what if we did it the Wednesday or Thursday before that meeting? OK. That still gives the applicant four weeks to do the buffer. So the Wednesday before September 21st? That's the 15th. Yeah. Tuesday would be the 14th. So. So. Wednesday would yeah. be the 15th. So 7.30 on the 15th? September 15th. Yeah. Mark, is that all right? Yes. OK. We have any other? Questions of the applicant or any questions from the applicant before we move on? All right, thank you. Very good, thank you. Oh, we need a motion. That's right, I forgot. You want a motion? I would love one. Uh, motion for the board to consider, be it further ordered, that the above application be tabled to the regular September 21, 2004 meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing shall be held. All in favor? Okay, that passes. Thank you. Thank you. Any break? <laughs> Thank 
Um, next item on the agenda is the Blueberry Ridge subdivision amendments. Joe Fristacci requesting amendments to the previously approved 19 lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision. Uh, there also has been a court decision in this regard. So for that reason, uh, I would like to first hear from our town attorney. Mr. Parkinson, um, if you if you could, to perhaps tell us uh, what has happened and what the effect of the decision is, and what our options are from here. Good evening, members of the board. Um, let me bring you up to date as to what's happened in the court since we last spoke. You will recall you approved the subdivision. There was an appeal by some neighbors to the Superior Court. Uh, the Superior Court affirmed your decision, meaning it, it supported your decision. Uh, the neighbors took a subsequent appeal then to the Maine Supreme Court, the Law Court, and uh, an oral argument was held on March 10th, 2004. On June 3rd, uh, the court issued its decision. Uh, what the decision boils down to is a couple of key points. One is as pertains to the setback or the distance between building envelopes. And it's my understanding in speaking with Maureen O'Meara that there's been some subsequent ordinance changes which make those issues no longer uh, relevant because the, the applicable provisions that were in, in question in the lawsuit have now been changed. And um, if there's any question about that, we can discuss that further. The uh, second point was with regard to the sufficiency of your findings with regard to uh, landscape buffer. And the court has instructed you to issue a specific waiver as it pertains to uh, landscape buffer. So I just wanted to um, highlight decision is about a seven or eight page document and in that document it gives you a couple of specific instructions one is it says on remand the board must make findings pursuant to 1972 D of the open space uh, zoning and I believe in your packet is some proposed findings in that regard um, and also you need to make a waiver uh, uh, pursuant to the standards set forth in 16.3.5. So there's two things in, in, in front of you. I understand that the applicant is going to uh, describe to you the changes that have been made to the plan. Uh, I understand they're fairly technical in nature. Uh, one of the questions that you, I'm sure going to ask me is, does this require a public hearing? The answer is that a public hearing is optional. Your subdivision regulations say that in, in, in the context of an amendment, public hearing may be held, so that would mean it would be your call as to whether a public hearing is necessary or not. So um, just again to repeat, um, the court is asking you to issue more detailed findings on landscaping and under the uh, general open space standards in section 1972D. And I can, I'll jump up and help out if it's okay, if, if I think that you've missed something. Mm -hmm. um, I would say as a general matter, the Maine Supreme Court is putting a lot of emphasis on findings of fact, and it's not uncommon now for the court to send cases back based on what they perceive to be inadequate findings of fact. I would say compared to other findings of fact of other planning boards, this was a very detailed and elaborate uh, findings of fact there was only some technical difficulties 
with him. One other point before I sit down is that the court has said in a couple of cases in the last uh, few years that when there's talk, uh, when there's a discussion of a number of standards in a section, for example, 1972D says four or five different standards, don't take them as a blanket uh, vote. Don't, don't say that they've met all five standards. Take each standard and vote on them individually. And the reason could be is that um, you could have a split board and that each person feels differently on one standard. And so if you do a blanket vote, it could lead to a result that was different than if you voted on them individually. I could, I could kind of explain that further if you want me to, but you could have a subdivision where five people um, were opposed to the subdivision for all different reasons. So if you took each standard, it would go down four to one on each standard, but if you did an overall vote, it would go down five to nothing, and that's not the intent. The intent is you take each of these standards individually. And I know you went through that process before. I think there was probably 10 or 20 standards you voted on and did an excellent job. It's just a couple more you got to take a look at. Okay. All right, so, so as I understand the law court decision on the setback issue, my understanding is that we waived a setback requirement and the law court said based on prior case law, we did not have the authority to waive that. In the, since then, the ordinance of ordinances regarding that setback requirement have been amended and passed by the town council so we no longer have to waive anything and so that issue has been taken care of for better or for worse by the ordinance itself that's that correct right? and uh, the only minor uh, critique of that statement would be that you use the word wave and our position in litigation was that that those standards in the open space zoning uh, section were optional and so right. there weren't it wasn't really in the nature of, the, of, of a waiver right i understand uh, but that's a, 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 a fine point and in essence what you're saying and, and it's true is that those issues are sort of by the board now they're moot issues because of the change in the law that um now allows essentially what they're trying to do right Right, because I think it's important for people to know what is at issue and what isn't an issue that is no longer an issue. The other part of the decision had to do with our finding on buffer, and I think you've explained that, and we need to make findings specifically on that issue. Mm -hmm. um, and the general open space under 1972D, and I'll get into that. There was just maybe one or two points on that that could be beefed up a bit. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, and people can certainly feel free to disagree uh, with me, um, wouldn't be the first time. It, it, I'd like to hear from the applicant, and then we should determine, and I understand, Mr. Barrington, that it's at our option, but we should make a determination if we want to have a public hearing or not, because if we do, then this will be put off the next meeting. If we don't, we'll consider it tonight. Um, I, I have my own feelings on that, but I think it would help to listen to the applicant in terms of what they have in mind, and then we can make that determination. Everybody okay with that? Uh, yes. Um, and, and I appreciate your comments, too. I was not on the board at the time this came before the board originally. I don't, however, I was on the zoning board the same development came before the zoning board and um, I'm very familiar with plans and I also actually on my own position read the Supreme Court finding in June when it first came out. I'm sort of in the habit of doing that for being on the zoning board so I feel I'm sufficiently familiar with this that I feel comfortable sitting here but if you or the board feels I'd rather have me sit off to that too. No, I don't have any problem with it. I would say that that's sufficient that uh, you've uh, have a general familiarity. Also, this is a an amendment to a plan, and, it, and you're going to have a lot of situations, and already have had a lot of situations, I'm sure, where people have um, come in for an amendment, and I don't think it's a requirement that to act on that amendment you sat on the original board. Um, typically, the requirement is that if you're uh, you miss some meetings and you want to kind of get back on the board before the final vote, what 
the sort of the general rule of thumb is you listen to the tapes and read all the materials and say that on the record that you've, you've done that. Um, thank you. Hopefully you can find out if any um, member of the public or the applicant has any objection to if they do, then you might want to consider stepping aside. But, okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Parkinson. We'll probably be back to you. Um, can we hear from the applicant? Mr. Strahl, Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Jim Haddo. I'm here uh, with Tom Emery on behalf of Mr. Fristacci, who unfortunately cannot be here tonight. He is out of state on other business. but. Uh, I am just going to try to set the stage a little bit and, and try not to repeat what uh, Mr. Parkinson has already told you um, and just lay a little bit of groundwork for Mr. Emery who's going to tell you the substantive differences between what's been submitted to you and what was submitted before. I do want to highlight first the new setback or building envelope requirements in the open space section of your ordinance say in essence, that the front yard setback, that is to say the setback between the uh, road that provides access to a lot and the front of any principal structure needs to be at least 20 feet and the existing plan as it was submitted originally satisfies that. Your new ordinance requires a minimum five foot or the new amendment to your ordinance requires a minimum five foot setback on side and rear yard uh, setbacks and the plan as submitted more than satisfies that requirement. Uh, in fact, I believe you'll see that the setbacks in most of these lots are 20 feet on the side lines and rear lines. Um, and you'll see that uh, we've proposed an, to add a note on uh, job sheet 11, which is the, the fourth or fifth one in your packet that refers to uh, limiting the uh, building envelope to principal structures and that's because we have that extra space. Uh, in other words, we've given you, we've provided more setback than this ordinance requires uh, and the setbacks for decks and accessory structures are much, are much less. So that's the point of that, uh, that note. Uh, and there isn't really anything more to be said at this point, I think, about the setback issue. I think that's otherwise resolved by the amendment to the ordinance. I do want to mention, too, that an issue that didn't come before you before, uh, but that was raised by another different amendment to the ordinance, is the road width, the paved surface of the road. A, an amendment to your subdivision ordinance permits now that the paved surface of a road can be 22 feet in width rather than 24 feet in width, and so the plans have been altered to reflect that change. So that's another proposed amendment. Finally, with respect to the, uh, the buffers that are contemplated in your ordinance, uh, what Mr. Fristacci has done is uh, he has uh, submitted an, a plan that now shows a combination of a uh, limited clearing 10 foot buffer uh, plantings and only where an abutter has requested in writing that a fence be substituted for the plantings he's provided uh, fencing on the plan. So what you have before you are those requests in writing where they have been made that a fence be substituted for the plantings. Um, so that's that's what he's that that's what he's submitted at this point. Um, there are places where he has provided for plantings and a fence. Uh, now, on when when the when the law court took this up, one of the criticisms was that fencing was prohibited, and the law court rejected that argument. Said it's not that fencing is prohibited; it's that vegetation is required absent a, uh, absent a waiver. So what we're asking you to do in terms of a waiver is make the necessary findings in order to permit a waiver of the uh, requirement of a vegetative buffer only where uh, the abutters have specifically requested that in writing. 
So that's the legal outline of, of, uh, of what we're proposing. And I'll be available for any questions you may have, but otherwise I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Emery, who can talk to you about the specifics of the plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Emery. I'm a registered landscape architect and principal of Land Use Consultants. Um, our, our role in this project has been to provide both the stormwater uh, design and management uh, package as well as the landscape uh, design and, and uh, planning. Uh, Richard Manthorn is the other engineer working on the project and we hope that Richard is uh, doing well in Florida. Um, uh, but uh, the issues here this evening deal primarily with my uh, scope of work. Uh, what I'd like to do is just point out the specifics of where the uh, abutters have expressed a preference for uh, fencing, uh, where we're showing landscaping only, and where we're showing a combination of several options. Uh, to get everyone oriented, this is Mitchell Road, the proposed Blueberry uh, Road. The green here is all of the open space uh, for those of you who were on the planning board back when uh, the original subdivision was approved. There's a cross-hatched area here that indicated the extent of open space that was preserved as part of that that included uh, several house lots along Rosewood Drive. Uh, as part of this application, the open space has been extended to all of those green areas. In addition, uh, the two uh, detention basins are also undeveloped. Um, this plan shows, uh, again, I want to remind people that we are proposing street trees along the entire development. Uh, we're proposing to protect the existing woodland and wetland areas within uh, this area. And we're also proposing to add a boardwalk in here for access. Uh, there are two easements, uh, one near Red Oak Drive that allows pedestrian access to this wooded area and an area adjacent to Lot 1 that also provides access. Um, back before we did anything on the project, we met with uh, the Samorians. They expressed an interest in reviewing a buffer proposal with them. Uh, and as a result of that meeting, we custom designed a buffer, and that's been on the plan since day one. Uh, and that's, those plants are included in the uh, plant list up here. Uh, Mr. Pistacci has then contacted uh, most of the abutters, uh, and for those that uh, responded in writing, uh, there's a red line here that indicates that the fence will begin here with a barren parcel and continue uh, to the edge of the Miller parcel. At that point, it will change to the proposed landscape buffer, which is uh, evergreen trees five to six feet tall. Uh, as we get uh, to the Bumstead parcel, that then changes to a 10-foot wide limited clearing buffer, uh, preservation of trees within that area, and infill uh, beneath the canopy where there's room to do so. Uh, I know you have a letter, I've read the letter from uh, Ms. Bumstead regarding uh, other concerns about trees that lie outside uh, that 10-foot buffer. Uh, Mr. Pistacci's position on this has been all along that he will endeavor to protect trees uh, near that buffer and outside that buffer to the extent practicable, but to the extent that construction doesn't allow for that as a mitigating measure he's proposing to put in the landscape buffer and for those who uh, express interest uh, provide a fence. As we uh, get past the uh, Bumstead parcel, the Pedersen uh, parcel has a combination of both fence directly behind their uh, garage or shed, and the rest they have uh, expressed a preference to have as a landscape buffer, so they'll get a new uh, buffer in there as well. Uh, so not all of these lots are fully wooded. Uh, some of them have already been cleared uh, into uh, Mr. Pistacci's property line. I have photographs of those that were presented at the uh, final approval if the board uh, uh, would like to have um, any of those reviewed again. Uh, what we've done on the plan is we've shown uh, in yellow the trees that we feel located that are the larger trees that fall within this 10-foot buffer. Uh, behind uh, the Payne residence, we're showing a 10-foot limited clearing buffer. We're also showing the preservation of overstory trees and the addition of understory landscape buffer. Then along both the fog parcel Charlotte Road, uh, the vacated portion of Charlotte Road, and uh, the Sawyer parcel, 
was showing a 10 foot limit clearing buffer that entire length. We're proposing to add a six foot high wood fence along that entire length, as well as to provide infill uh, evergreen plantings along that length. And then the rest of the uh, buffers would be uh, limited clearing buffers. With respect to the narrow road width, that didn't affect any of our work other than to uh, change a couple of inverts on culverts. We didn't uh, have to redesign the project at all. And Mr. Manthorn uh, did show a typical section on his plans and a narrow road on the uh, plan sheet. Just uh, since the issue of the buffer has come up, uh, we presented this board as part of the original approval, and on it we have several, we have existing conditions examples along uh, all property lines. But what I wanted to show that uh, in the original proposal, we put into context those trees that were, are being proposed along the roadway, the buffer options that we had discussed at the time, which were either a fence or the severed green uh, screen, and then typical suburban infill landscaping that would be the responsibility of the homeowner. And again, uh, something like this is not unusual in my experience uh, living in Cape Elizabeth as to what homeowners are generally doing these days uh, in subdivisions. I think it's important not to just show the houses on the ground and the roads and the street trees, but to show the overall site development. Um, and I guess lastly, with all due respect to the law court, what we're talking about here is human beings, people to people, single family residences to single family residences. And my sense is that we've lost track of that. Uh, I've included, as part of the previous presentation, I included a photograph. Uh, I've lived in Cape Elizabeth in tw for 20 years in a uh, neighborhood of what was considered at the time small lots. These are 10,000 square foot lots, slightly larger than, than the lots Mr. Pistacci is proposing and considerably larger than the existing lots that were developed in South Portland. Uh, the point I want to make, however, is I moved here in the early 80s and there was an existing wood fence behind my yard and the neighbor had planted, these photos were taken a year or so ago, but the neighbor had planted uh, hemlocks and uh, spruce trees along that fence line. And I remember seeing the tops of them just popping up over that six foot fence. This is a photo, uh, the neighbor who bought the house, it's been through two owners who most recently bought the house, tore down the fence and I was a little aghast until I saw what was on the other side. On the other side were understory of rhododendrons, ground covers, a whole plethora of plant material and the original planting took place within about a 10 foot wide strip because the trees were small enough, they were tall enough, and that has uh, developed into a wonderful backyard landscape. Um, again, people to people, single family residential use, to single family residential use. There was a question that the engineer raised with regards, uh, regarding the use of the town's engineer with respect to uh, Canadian hemlocks. There is indeed uh, an ailment uh, an aphid-like infestation, uh, woolly adelgid. And I've checked with O'Donnell's Nurseries in Gorham. They continue to sell uh, Canadian hemlocks. I feel quite strongly about Canadian hemlocks because both of their form, their ra reasonably rapid growth rate, their ability to do well in an understory situation, partial shade. Uh, the state put a quarantine on the importation of Canadian hemlocks in the year 2000, which means that they all have to be inspected before they're allowed into the state. Additionally, responsible nurseries like O'Donnell's, where these would be purchased, or a similar quality nursery, uh, are very, very careful to inspect the, the new plant material. In a personal example, I've transplanted uh, Canadian hemlock uh, in a natural setting from one cottage site to another that was about three to four feet tall. Those trees are now over nine to 10 feet tall. This is over the last three years. Um, since I did it with such, let's put it hands on, I've been very careful to inspect those uh, plants and would, would uh, offer that in the event that there does become an availability to issue, we would suggest that they substitute either cedar slash um, arborvitae as a, as a substitute at the same height. 
full-size ones, not the little globe ones and not the extremely upright junipers that some people think are sometimes cedars. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Emery. Um, as I indicated before, I think the next thing we have to do is determine whether we want to move on to substantive discussion of this application and vote on approval tonight or table this for a public hearing. Um, I'll, I'll give my position and then I'll, I'll be quiet, but it, it seems to me that what this amendment to the application really has boiled down to is the issue of buffer and adequate buffers in connection with the uh, abutters and given the fact that it, it's come down to a point where buffer is dependent on what the abutters may want or not want uh, and given the fact that I know from having served on the board for quite a while that, that people that abut this development feel have strong feelings about it and, and have been very active in the application. Um, I personally would feel more comfortable in having a public hearing, listening to the concerns, some which may be relevant, some which may not, given what's happened uh, regarding the issues of, of the buffer and, and what people's thoughts and, and preferences are. Um, but as you've heard, we it is up to us. We can move on tonight and vote on this uh, or not. Barbara. If, <coughs> excuse me. If we decide to have a public hearing, I would strongly recommend that it be solely limited to buffering because we're just going to hear the same things we had two public hearings the last time that we have already heard that may not even be relevant. And I think that we are only dealing with what the court found at this point. So if we have one, I would limit it. I would vote to limit it in terms of context. Well, uh, Dave. Uh, John, I, I'm not in favor of holding a public hearing on the proposed amendments to this uh, uh, subdivision. I believe we've already heard uh, a great deal from the abutters on the issue of the buffer and I, I'm just simply not sure what new information is out there that could possibly have an impact on our decision on this application. Uh, I think we've, I don't believe there was any, any issue raised by the law court as to the adequacy of the public hearing or the ability of the abutters to participate in the hearing process. I think that opportunity has been made available. It doesn't mean that I'm not sympathetic to their position. Uh, I'm sure I'd be feeling having many of the same sentiments that they have if this, this were going on in my backyard, but I just don't see the need for a public hearing here. Dave? I tend to concur with David's position. I also feel that, that many of the butters have voiced their opinion on what they would prefer on their adjoining their property as far as the buffer is concerned. I don't see any reason that, uh, I don't see any need for a hearing. I don't see anything coming out of the hearing that will affect uh, my thought on this issue at this point. Mr. Chairman, yeah. I'm comfortable in moving forward this evening. I believe we received the necessary information from the abutters and the applicant in regards to the buffer. And I would be comfortable in voting on this application this evening. Okay. John. Oh, sorry, Barbara. One more point, and that is I think that the applicant has made a very sincere effort to go to every single abutter and find out what they would like, and that's important. I concur with, I guess, the majority here that I don't see a need for another public hearing. It's a very, very narrow issue that we're concerned with there as far as the buffer. Okay. Well, it's like the will of the board then is, that, is to move on to the 
consideration of the application. So uh, we can do that. If are there are any further questions of the board or of Mr. Parkinson before we continue. Mr. Parkinson, I believe before you indicated that you had some information you wanted to give us about findings. You were talking about what what's required of us in terms of yeah. specific. Yeah, I just want to be clear what uh, I think the the range of findings you, you need to consider. You have, of course, Marine's uh, memorandum that talks about findings under 16.31C, and there's uh, 4.7. Uh, to that that need to be voted on individually. Everybody okay. with me on that? Yep. Then there's a separate sheet that talks about the preamble to 16.3. says, with respect to only those areas where abutters have been, have specifically requested in writing yep. that fencing be substituted for vegetative buffer to compliance. Yep. I, just, I just want to make sure every member of the board, you have this on the podium tonight. Yes. It's a single yep. sheet of paper. And the title is Proposed Findings. And if you could all find it, that's what it's reading from. There's a, need for, there's a need for finding that strict compliance with the requirements of plants or other types of vegetative cover be preserved or placed around the border. The proposed subdivision to provide adequate buffer may cause restriction upon imaginative and otherwise desirable design. That sounds like a, a lawyer's written sentence. <laughs> sure does. It's a long sentence, but um, I think it's a, a necessary finding. And then there's three other, six other findings on that sheet, and I believe only Mr. Haddo would um, three to jump in here. I believe only findings four through six are necessary. I believe one through three have already been made by the board in its prior extensive findings. Okay. And you will note that Maureen in her proposed findings notes that all of the previous uh, conditions are still in effect. And obviously, I think you should note for the record that your previous findings are in, in full force of effect as well. In other words, we're just adding to those findings should you choose to do so. Well, I don't want to prejudge what your vote will be on these things, but I just want to make it clear that the previous findings, they in, in full force and effect, and these are additions to them as required by the law court. Right. So you're saying that one through three are findings that have already been made. Yeah, they're, they're definitely in the previous text. They weren't specifically cited, but four is the landscape one. Five is about maximizing area for woodlot production and outdoor recreation. I don't believe you made a specific finding on that. I think it would be implied that you made that finding, but I think it would be helpful to make that finding should you choose to do so. And then six, it's, it seems like it, it's not relevant, but um, you should make a finding on it. Incidentally, that section does say make findings to the extent relevant. Yeah. But the law, law court seems to be saying to you to take a crack at each one. On six, the building lots or, or building locations are laid out in a manner that permits each lot access to the open space without having to cross another another's lot. In this case, you just you don't go across another's lot. You go down the road or the sidewalk to, right. to get there. So. Mr. Anybody have questions? Yeah, Dave. Just the numbers four through six on the sheet. I think four through six is what you need to do, and then that first paragraph. So you might want to. Uh, well, my yeah, my question is, where would it make sense for four through six to be incorporated, if we were to adopt them? I think what you should do is um, perhaps start with the findings that Maureen uh, has suggested under. Uh, Article 16, 
with the preamble on the top of the page of the separate sheet, get through that, and then after that make the following supplemental findings under 1972D1. I, I assume this will all be sorted out then once you make these votes, if you do make these votes, you know, in a letter uh, like you did before that will lay out what, what the board did vote. What I'm trying to figure out is how to jive four through six with one through six, seven, eight. I think right. One through I think six. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. But I think if we start with the motion that I wrote. Yes. And we, we leave, we're okay with finding one that I wrote, finding two, finding three, finding four. Yes. All A, B, C, and D. Yep. Finding five. And I think what you're saying is that you would then take the separate sheet, numbers four, five, and six, and renumber re them six, seven, and eight, and insert them in? I think that would work. And then you also need to do that preliminary finding on the top of that sheet that was that super long sentence I read about the restriction on imaginative and otherwise desirable design. You could make that finding uh, 3.5. I would make that 3.5, yeah, I, would, I think that would be a good place, stick that before 4, because okay. it seems to be sort of a introduction to, to 4. And then one vote? No. no we, we uh, vote, we vote, vote on each, each one individually. I'm sorry to bother you with uh, the separate voting, but right. let, let me let, let, let me summarize here. If, if a motion is made on these findings of fact, motion has to be made and then I will have a vote on each separate finding. Okay, is that understood? So if, if you make the motion and second the motion, then we'll go through each of the findings. In fact, you can vote on each one any way you feel and then at some point someone's going to have to keep track of the vote so that you determine if they're all approved or not approved or somewhere in between. In between all of you, I'm sure you can keep track of that. Okay. The other thing that the law court emphasizes, not so much in, in your the case that's in front of you, is the, is the necessity to um, discuss uh, after the motion, too, to, you know, to have some record something on the record um, backing up your finding. Um, and some of these are very obvious, uh, that, like the number six that I, I read, but somebody, so you don't just go too fast through them, just have a, a little discussion after each one would, would be helpful. Somehow some that could be inserted in the gist of that discussion, it would, I think, make the finding stronger. Well, I mean, we've had a discussion here yeah. on all of these issues, and if we I'll ask for further discussion on each uh, before the vote. And we may have or we may not have, depending on if we feel we've discussed it enough. So That's, that's fine. It, it, hopefully the, the, the written findings will reflect some, some of the analysis that you did, to the extent it's necessary. If it's just totally common sense, right. then I don't think you have much to worry about. Right. The law court, is, it, it really is a, a fairly burdensome requirement to vote on each of these requirements. And I can tell you, that most towns don't do that and haven't really gotten with the program. The, the typical um, variance uh, decision will be just a vote up or down at, at a zoning board, and, and most planning boards don't have right. this kind of detail. So and that's what keeps lawyers in business, right? Yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. Barbara? John, it seems to me that this paragraph up here on the top, 3.5 just leaves me hanging, but I think it belongs in number four just so never reads this. The applicant has had a 10 foot wide vegetative buffer strip down, except for abutters that indicated they would prefer a fence. And then this slides right in there with respect only to those areas where abutters have specifically required. Yeah, I think that would work. Yeah. That agree. seems like the best yeah. place for it. That would be fine. Too. Okay. Yep. Is somebody willing to get the ball rolling? 
as they say. We're going to do these one at a time. We're going to vote on them one at a time. A motion has to be made uh, for approval, and then we'll go through each of the findings of fact. So you have to read the findings of fact, and then we'll vote on each one. So whoever makes the motion has the pleasure of going through each of the findings of fact. I'm not sure I understood where you were, your insertion, so maybe it would be Barbara okay, to do it. Under number four, under findings of fact, it says the applicant has added a 10 foot wide vegetative strip, that first sentence, then add this insert that comes from the top of this page that we're going to take six, seven, eight, walk up the second page and add in with respect only to those areas where Butters has specifically requested that paragraph. Yeah, why, don't, why don't you make the motion and then you read it the way you've proposed and if right. we don't like it, we'll let you know. And I have a motion for the board's approval. <coughs> Findings of that. Joseph Rostovsky is requesting amendments to the previously approved Blueberry Ridge subdivision located off Mitchell Road to address changes required by a recent court decision and to reduce the road width. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. All right. Now, on the specific findings of fact, is there any further discussion? Seems fairly self-evident. All in favor? Okay. Go ahead, Barbara. Number two, the law court has remanded the subdivision approval back to the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to properly apply the building envelope setback required in section 1972, open space zoning, and the buffering standard required in section 1631C of the subdivision ordinance. Is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded. Any further discussion on that? Again, that seems self-evident. All in favor? Okay. Number three, ordinance amendments effective December 10, 2003 have revised the building envelope setback to read, the bounds of the building envelope shall be at least 20 feet from the right of way of the road serving the lot and at least five feet from any side or rear lot line. The building envelopes in the Blueberry Ridge subdivision meet these setback requirements. Second. Second then. Um, again, I, we've had that discussion about the change of the ordinance and that it meets the requirements of further Discussion? All in favor? Number four, the applicant has added a 10 foot wide vegetative buffer strip and additional planting along the perimeter of the subdivision, except where abutters have indicated that they would prefer a fence. With respect only, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with respect only to those areas where abutters have specifically requested in writing that fencing be substituted for a vegetative buffer, strict compliance with the requirement that plants or other types of vegetative cover shall be preserved or placed around the border of the proposed subdivision to provide for an adequate buffer may cause restriction upon imaginative and otherwise desirable design. Where fencing is proposed, the planning board waives as provided for in section 16-3-5 of the subdivision ordinance requirement of section 16-3-1C in favor of fencing and finds that the substitution of fencing in lieu of planting A will not create more hazardous traffic conditions or less sanitary sewer disposal conditions than strict compliance. B will provide more varied and imaginative subdivision layout and design. C will secure sub substantially the standards of road design and construction required by this chapter and the zoning ordinance and D will not have the desired effect of nullifying the intent and objectives of the comprehensive plan or this chapter. Second. There's a second. Discussion on this aspect. Council recommending we vote on A, B, C, and D independently of one another? Yeah. Well, I, I see it as one finding of fact, so I think we can vote it as one. Um, I, just on further discussion on this one, uh, normally I don't like to have uh, 
conditions based on what a specific abutter may or may not want, obviously because that abutter may not be that abutter three, five, ten years from now. Um, in this particular case, however, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to address the type of buffer this way where if somebody um, prefers a fence, they can have a fence, and I say that because otherwise I guess the burden and cost would fall on the abutter to build the fence, whereas here the developer is doing it. So in this case, I, I think that type of distinction is, is appropriate. Dave? In addition to that, I think the applicant has exhibited an extreme effort to make this condition acceptable and produce a working arrangement. I'm very comfortable with it. <clears throat> Any further discussion on the motion, Jack? I'd like to ask Council if he's uncomfortable with us voting on A, B, C, and Z as a group. It's okay. First one, Donald. Yeah. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Number five, the amendments to the subdivision ordinance effective 12 10 of 2003 reduce the minimum width of the dead end road from 24 feet to 22 feet. Second. Moved and seconded. This is the Reduction of the width of the road. Any further discussion? I think again we've heard the reasoning behind that and uh, it seems appropriate on, under the current plan. All in favor? Number six, building lots or building locations are laid out in a manner that preserves or allows the establishment of a vegetated buffer to serve as an effective visual screen from adjacent properties. And such a buffer has been preserved and will be established except where owners of adjacent properties have expressly requested. And this board has approved the substitution of fencing for a vegetated buffer. See ordinance section 16-3-1C, pursuant to ordinance section 16-3-5. Second. Moved and seconded. Again, I believe we discussed the issue of the buffer extensively. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Number seven, the building lots or building locations are laid out in a manner that maximizes the amount of contiguous usable area for woodlot production and outdoor recreation included as part of the required open space. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Number eight, the building lots or building locations are laid out in a manner that permits each house lot access to a to the open space without having to cross another house lot. Second. Second. Again, that's fairly self-evident. All in favor? Number nine, the subdivision substantially complies with the standards of the subdivision ordinance. Second. Any discussion? We've just gone through the requirements of the ordinance, looked at the application. I'm comfortable that it meets the requirements. All in favor? Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented that the application of Joseph Rostovsky for amendments to the previously approved Blueberry Ridge subdivision located off Mitchell Road be approved subject to the following conditions that all of the previous findings and conditions placed on the April 22, 2002 approval are still in full force in effect. Second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the final motion? All in favor? All right. That's approved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Farmer. You can rest your yep. voice.
Congratulations. Barbara's going to check them. <laughs> better be right. <laughs> All right, the next but unfortunately not last item in the agenda is the Murray Private Road Review. Uh, Stephen Murray requesting review of a private road under subdivision ordinance and resource protection permit to create frontage for two lots located off Fowler Road. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I would like to recuse myself in the uh, fact that my son is uh, involved in this project, and, uh, unless somebody else has a reason not to allow me. But. That's, that's fine. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates. I represent uh, Steve Murray for a uh, request for a private road. Uh, before we get into the proposal, I'd like to present to the board uh, some of the existing conditions of the property. Uh, on sheet one, existing conditions plan uh, is an outline of the, of the property. Um, the property is located on the northerly side of Fowler Road between Hampton Road and Jewett Road. Uh, there is 26 feet of frontage on Fowler Road. This location is, if you're not familiar with Hampton or Jewett, um, it is the long straight, straight away uh, right after you make the bend in, in Fowler Road. It's roughly in the middle of that straight away. The uh, property consists of 4.6 acres. Uh, there are two different parcels. Parcel A is the subject property uh, in which Steve Murray, who is here this evening, uh, wants to build a residence for himself. And parcel B is also owned by Steve. Um, and this parcel was uh, just recently conveyed to, to Steve. Um, the property is located in the residential A zoning district. Some of the natural features of the property, uh, topographically, uh, the property slopes in a northerly direction, uh, parcel B. Um, there's a, roughly, the high point is, is just off of Fowler Road, then it slopes down towards the wetland area, areas which are illustrated in the, in the green. Um, and then parcel A continues to slope in a northerly direction. Um, as you can see, there's a fairly um, moderate uh, gradient to the parcel, and then it flattens out at the bottom of the parcel. Drainage, uh, it is primarily sheet drainage on both parcels. Uh, there are a series of drainage swales in this area here, uh, which the runoff flows into these drainage swales. It ultimately enters an intermittent stream at this point here and flows into um, the lower portions of the property. Uh, the soils, the wetland soils, we have uh, Scarborough soil in the RP1 wetland and we have the Nuremberg uh, soils in the RP2 wetlands. Vegetation, uh, parcel B is primarily an open field. I have illustrated the tree line along the, uh, along the uh, westerly property line. 
And parcel A is entirely wooded, consisting of a mix of hardwoods and softwoods, uh, primarily green ash, red oak, and uh, balsam fir. The utilities, uh, we have, there's an eight inch public water main in Fowler Road. Um, there is no sewer, public sewer. There will be, uh, there is overhead electric telephone and cable. And as you can also see, there is a, an existing gravel roadway uh, that is used, I guess, exclusively by uh, Steve's brother, Skip, who resides in this, on this uh, property here. So uh, that, that's a brief overview of the existing uh, conditions of the property. Um, and as, as you can also see, the site is uh, almost entirely surrounded by existing residential, single-family residential uses. Uh, there is some town-owned land uh, located along this property line here. The proposal consists of a private road, a proposal for a private road uh, to provide access to this rail lot or parcel A and to provide the required frontage uh, for parcel A as well as parcel B. Uh, right now, parcel A does not have any road frontage. Um, it's a non-conforming approved lot, and parcel B, as I mentioned, has 26 feet of frontage on Fowler Road. So we are proposing a uh, private road which will consist of the first 160 feet will be a paved section, 18 feet wide, with curbs on either side. Um, and then it will transition into a 14 foot wide gravel road with a required uh, hammerhead turnaround at the end. The reason we're proposing a, uh, a curb section here, paved curb section, is because of the narrowness of uh, the land area here. Uh, having a curved road, paved road section with contained drainage uh, will not require ditches or swales on either side of the road. The 14 foot wide section will be, uh, will have uh, roadside ditches um, on either side. The road will be crowned. Um, and as I said, it will curve around with a, a turnaround, which has been approved by uh, Chief McGoldrick. We are crossing uh, some wetlands, and we have impacted a total of 5,312 square feet of RP2 wetland. Uh, and we have, um, as you can see from the grading and drainage plan, we have tried to minimize the wetland impact in this area. Um, in the design of the, the hammerhead and also the design of the grading, uh, we've gone to a two to one side slope. Uh, we have included in our packet a drainage uh, report prepared by DH2M. Um, basically, the increased runoff as a result of this is, is minimal, um, and I believe that Steve Harding agrees with our. Um, approach in letting it sheet run off into the, into the wetlands uh, without detention. So that is a, uh, the total length of the road, by the way, is 660 feet um, from this point to the end of the M head. Um, we are proposing to run the um, public water to the property and underground electric telephone and cable. Um, I would, at, at this point, like to review the, uh, we received uh, Maureen's and Steve Harding's uh, comments last week, and I would like to uh, review briefly with you some of the items uh, that pertain to completeness. Um, on, in Maureen's memo, under summary of completeness, uh, 3A, private road has not been named, which is true. 
we did propose a name to the town. They rejected it. Uh, we proposed Lydia Lane, which is Steve's daughter's name. Um, and they felt that it was too close to Lydon Lane, so they rejected it. So we are in the process of coming up with a new name, and we'll have it on our next submission. Uh, 6B, the lot line, uh, Maureen is correct that uh, the lot line that separates parcel A from parcel B was not shown, but it is now shown, and that is uh, this line right here. Uh, all of the plans have been revised, by the way. Uh, under the resource protection permit, uh, we inadvertently had not checked the box off on the, the front page of the application form to indicate that there was a resource protection permit required. We have done that, um, and we have paid the fee, the required fee, to, uh, uh, to administer that permit. Items number five and six uh, for a wetland, for a resource protection permit, items five and six are required. <clears throat> and we just received, uh, actually we received it uh, yesterday, I believe, a wetland delineation report that was prepared by uh, Dale Brewer. Um, he had prepared the the delineation which we have shown on our plan is just that we have not received the narrative um, which describes both the soil types and the vegetation. This will be submitted in our next, uh, in our next submission. Uh, in number 10 has been done, the delineation of the building envelope, uh, that is uh, this building envelope. We had delineated this building envelope, but we had not delineated this. That has been done. And number 11, the calculation of the wetland impact, as I said, uh, we have a total of 5,312 square feet, and that has been placed on the plan. And with regard to uh, Steve Harding's uh, comments, um, if I read this accurately, Steve uh, didn't come up with any, a lot, of, a lot of these are very technical items, and I believe he has, uh, he didn't come up with any items that would make this application incomplete. And that, I believe, is stated in number three of his letter. So, uh, and we have addressed all of Steve's comments. We've got a letter that's going to go out tomorrow. Uh, with the plan, with the revised plans. Uh, and just finally, I'd like to just <clears throat> on uh, the checklist, which I believe you have in your packet, uh, just going down the minor subdivision review, I'd like to address the partial and the nose. Uh, 3A, uh, Marine has a partial for the road name. That's because we don't have the, the name of the road. We're working on that. Uh, 6B, uh, there's a partial, and that has to do with this lot line right here, which has been added to the plans. And then on the resource protection permit, there is a, under item 5, uh, Marine has a no. Uh, and with all due respect to Marine, Correct me if I'm wrong, Maureen, but um, I would think that that should be a P partial uh, because we have shown the wetland upland edge of the site. We have shown the delineation of the, of the wetlands. Um, and as I said, we've got the report that will, will, which will provide the narrative. <coughs> uh, and then under six, uh, same thing, it's a, it's a partial. But we've got the report, uh, which we'll be submitting, which will provide a narrative on the soil types. Under 10, uh, the partial has to do with the building envelope, uh, which we have delineated. And under 11, I believe that that should be either a P or a, or a Y. Um, the way I interpret that is, um, that is detailed information, specifications 
on the grading, drainage, and utilities plan, which we have provided, as well as site details. Is that not correct? I think with your wetlands report, we can convert everything to a Y. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, under 11, the, the grading and drainage uh, provides all of the detail um, for those aspects of the project. Right. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, reminding the board that this is here only for determination of completeness. Uh, you've heard the issues that were raised. Is there any further discussion or further questions of the applicant on completeness? Okay. Do we have a motion? I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Stephen Murray for a private road and a resource protection permit to create road frontage for two lots located off Fowler Road, U20-11-1-6, be deemed complete. Moved and seconded. All in favor? That is approved. We have another motion. Be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular September 21, 2004 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Second. Seconded. Any further discussion on the motion? All in favor? <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, does any, would anyone feel that a site walk is necessary? I don't see the need for a site walk here. No. No. Okay. I guess not. Has there been any concern expressed by? I got a Butter? phone call from Amanda Butter um, when we sent out the notices for the workshop. And because you're talking about a 26 foot wide strip that runs, what, 150 feet off of Fowler Road, and two of Butter's relatively close to an 18 foot wide road. I thought you might want to see that. You could always do it on your own time. Sure, we will. Uh, so we are having a public hearing so the, the butters can appear. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> on to the back of our sheet, the agenda. <laughs> Um, I think, and it has nothing to do with the lateness of the hour, but I think we can go through these fairly quickly because we discussed them uh, on numerous occasions. Um, the first is a discussion of the BA District Zoning Amendment where a request by Fitzpatrick Associates to amend the zoning ordinance 19-6-B BA District to clarify the status of multifamily units in the BA District. Um, Maureen, refresh my memory. Are we, we are making a recommendation? Um, all you would be asked to do this evening would be to table this to the September meeting, at which point you would be holding the public hearing that you're required to hold before you can make a recommendation. Right. Well, I have a motion for the board to consider then. <laughs> Go right ahead. Be it ordered that the planning board table the BA zoning district amendments to the regular September 21, 2004 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing shall be held in accordance with section 19-10-3 amendments. Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor? I hope we realize that we are making the next meeting just as long as this meeting by all these. <laughs> all right. Um, the final item is the, uh, the BB District Zoning <coughs> Amendment request by the Murray family to amend Zoning Ordinance Section 19-6-6. BB District and a zoning map amendment to permit 
moving the contracting office located on Shore Road to the Murray Pit located at 31 Fowler Road under Section 19-10-3 Zoning Ordinance Amendment. Um, I assume everyone's had an opportunity to review the text amendment and map amendment. And if they are uh, questions or discussion, um, as you know, there's been a change, not a change, addition, further clarification of some of the definitions and also setbacks. So, Barbara? The only question I have, I thought we had decided on 28, we had discussed 20 acres and 15th in here. I checked my notes and I did see 20. That sounds familiar to me. I'd, I'd be happy to change the, the draft to 20 acres and that would be what you would send to public hearing. That, that was my recollection too. Yeah. Okay. Um, John, are we, we doing the same? Are we going to have to table this to a public hearing? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, just, if there's any further questions or discussions on the text of the amendments, if it's ready to go out to a public hearing with the change that we just had, then uh, I'd be more than happy to take a motion to do that. I have a motion from the board to consider. Be it ordered the planning board tables the BB zoning district amendments and BB zoning map amendment to the regular September 21, 2004 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing shall be held in accordance with section 19-10-3 amendments. Second. second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. I move we adjourn. Second. All in favor. Thank you, everyone.